The post-Hercynian continental red beds are informally known in North Africa as the Nubian sandstones. Nubian outcrops cover the large central parts of both the Kufra and Murzuk basins today. The spectacular canyons in Jebel bin Ganima at the eastern Murzuk margin are a Nubian open-air museum. Typical fluvial-dominated strata, planar and trough crossbeds, channels, some overbank and lacustrine muds. That's essentially it. The Nubian is no longer an official name used in Libyan stratigraphy, but it is rather practical nevertheless. Officially, the Nubian is represented by three units. The triassic Sarsitine Formation, the jurassic Tauratine Formation, and the Upper Jurassic to Lower Cretaceous Mesak Formation. Of these, the Mesak is the most attractive in the field. In Murzuk, it forms a huge cliff stretching over 300 kilometers across the open desert. A nice little challenge for pipeline planners. The scarlet is, is very, very uh, close to NC-115. It looks like as a boundary between NC-115 and NC-174. So this scarlet is, a, is a quite high. During the late Cretaceous and early tertiary, the sea made its last appearance in southern Libya. Around Cenomanian Turonian times, global sea level had climbed to a Phanerozoic record high. A large Trans-Saharan seaway formed, connecting the Tethys with the Atlantic Ocean. Part of the seaway ran along the western Tibesti margin, flowing gently around the Murzuk Island. Falling sea level interrupted the seaway in the Santonian to Maastrichtian, but it got re-established during the Paleocene. Carbonates and marls dominated the face sheets. When the Oligocene came, the sea had to withdraw from southern Libya. Since then, it's never been seen again. It also marked the end of sedimentation in southern Libya. Although rather unspectacular, the Nubian sandstone is critical for the Paleozoic petroleum plays in Murzuk and Kufra. And this is purely related to its thickness and role as overburden material. In the central parts of the southern Libyan basins, the Nubian gets up to two kilometers thick. The Silurian source rock would not have expelled its precious organic juice without the Nubian overburden. Huge sedimentary thickness means there was a lot of space that waited to be infilled. Space created by two main phases of increased subsidence. The first extensional event affected the whole of North Africa. After Pangaea's best days were over, the supercontinent broke apart. From the late Permian onwards, Turkey and other blocks separated from northern Gondwana. 
deep rift grabens opened up all along the North Africa margin. The extensional stress also affected southern Libya, where the ground began to subside rapidly. The second extensional event in southern Libya started in the early Cretaceous. A complex zone of rift grabens formed across north and central Africa. The birth of the Sirt Basin. Breakup days of western Gondwana shortly before the North and South Atlantic became united. The enormous accommodation space created in southern Libya by the extensional events was soon filled up. The Silurian source rock got buried deeper and deeper. Eventually, temperatures and pressure were too much for the organic matter stored in the hot shale. Chemical bonds cracked and hydrocarbons formed. Enormous amounts of hydrocarbons, many billions of barrels, as simple modeling shows. The peak hydrocarbon generation phases in both the Morzuk and Kufra basins must have occurred sometime between the Jurassic and Tertiary. The question in southern Libya is not how much oil once was generated, the question is rather how much and where is it preserved? While the general mechanism and timing today are well understood, there are unfortunately some very important details that we still haven't properly figured out. Details that are critical to the hydrocarbon play and continue to cost us a lot of money when they once more fooled us again. In terms of the geology and the petroleum system, Probably the thing which remains the biggest challenge for us is getting a proper understanding of the distribution and maturity of the source rock, but in particular understanding the migration pathways between individual prospects and the source kitchen. This has been a fundamental problem all through the exploration history of the Mazouk Basin in particular, but I'm sure the same will apply in the Kufra Basin. Uh, and it's one of the things that we focus particular attention on in terms of trying to understand the risks and uncertainties associated with exploration in the southern Libyan basins. We never quite understood whether the kitchen was in the centre of the Mazouk Basin or maybe migration had come from a, a different area, for example, uh, out towards the Afshan Arch towards Algeria. The oil was fairly light, um, although it had very low aromatics indicating possibly water washing. Uh, the B1 NC174 well encountered a very good source rock section and we had this analysed for various maturity parameters, especially the GCMS maturity parameters and the maturity given by that uh, Tanazuf hot shale uh, was precisely what we'd modelled, just entering the oil window. So it, the thermal story seemed to be correct and what seemed to be uh, uh, what seemed to be more of a mystery was where exactly was the oil migrating from because if you had a basin, a kitchen in the centre of the Mazouk Basin the oil should have had difficulty migrating to structures like Elephant or A1NC115 indeed um, from our offer contouring uh, which was done once we'd restored the maps back for any Cretaceous tilting so it was really the migration model which we had the greatest uncertainty about Today, there's a lot of evidence for short distance migration. Local source kitchens from where hydrocarbons migrated over a few kilometers or a few tens of kilometers into the trap. But what about longer migration distances in southern Libya? I'm, I'm inclined to think the migration distances were relatively short. And that is because of the character of the Ordovician sandstones. The periglacial sandstone sequence, the Mamumiat sandstones, are very heterolithic. There are a lot of complexity in them. And they don't look to me as if they would be a, make a good, long, uh, good lateral conduit. The Hawaii sandstones are rather poorer quality, and although they are more continuous, in fact, they are broken up by the, the, uh, um, the deep erosional incision. And again, it's difficult to imagine long-distance migration through, through them. However, that said, I do feel it's possible in certain circumstances 
lateral migration over significant distances might be possible. Um, we, we know that the glaciers advanced and retreated in a, in a roughly north to south direction. And this would suggest that the, the, the channels and the, and, the, and the main sand fairways associated with glacial deposition um, are, have, a, have a, a very strong north-south alignment. Where that alignment is conveniently orientated with respect to the structural dip, it's quite possible some of these axial sands may have focused migration in particular directions. And, and in those situations, lateral migration might have been quite significant. By the mid-tertiary, most of the source kitchens in Murzuk and Kufra must have been shut down. Tectonic forces had pushed up the Silurian hot shale. After it had left the oil window, the source rock cooled down and stopped generating hydrocarbons. The phenomenon was studied in greater detail only a few years ago in the Murzuk Basin. We have a lot of inversions in the, in the area. The margin has been inverted, so that means we have a shallow uh, depth for the hot shale. And this is not, has been inverted uh, lately, after the maturation. Uh, in, the, in the northern part, we have now some fields at the depth of 2,000 feet only. And this has been inverted, could, could be inverted at certain time, maybe in the alpine uh, time and that bring the reservoirs in a shallow depth. What had happened? Afro-Arabia and Eurasia had collided. Numerous alpine fold belts formed all along the collisional zone. The Atlas in northwest Africa and the Sagrosh north of Arabia the most prominent ones. Libya itself was not directly involved in the crash. Once again, the central Sahara stayed out of trouble. Nevertheless, intraplate stress managed to reach southern Libya. In terms of stress propagation and tectonic impact in Murzuk and Kufra, the Alpine was not too different from the earlier Hercynian compression. In fact, the effects of both of those tectonic events are very strong as we move towards the west, into Algeria, into Morocco. But in fact, the, uh, the overall effects decline very quickly as we move eastwards and southwards. So by the time we come into the southern Libyan basins, then we don't see significant effects from either of those particular events. Certainly, the late Cretaceous to tertiary alpine compression did not create major folds or thrusts in southern Libya. Nevertheless, this tectonic event was of great importance to the Murzuk and Kufra petroleum systems, and this was related to uplift and the reactivation of existing faults. At the basin margins today, there are Cambrian rocks at surface. Based on what we know about the basin's tectonic history, there once were several kilometers of other strata on top of this. So exposure of the Cambrian today means that several kilometers of strata must have been uplifted and eroded here. Part of this uplift might have been Hercynian, the rest must be Alpine. In fact, when looked at in greater detail, there was another compressional event in the Cretaceous that contributed to the overall uplift, the so-called Austrian event of the mid-Cretaceous, the Aptian. It's quite clear this whole western part of Libya was uplifted and unroofed in, in Middle Cretaceous times and an enormous amount of sediment was stripped off. During the Austrian, many of the rift grabens that had formed during the early Cretaceous in North and Central Africa were inverted. The continental stress field controlled by the Africa-Europe plate approach, the opening Atlantic and the cert rifting had changed. In some parts of southern Libya, it was probably already the Austrian event that marked the end of local hydrocarbon generation. The Austrian and Alpine uplift of the basin margins of up to three kilometers has huge implications for regional hydrocarbon prospectivity. In some areas, close to the present-day basin margins, the Silurian may have been deeply buried until the early Cretaceous. 
Local source kitchens might have generated hydrocarbons here until alpine uplift shut them down in late Cretaceous or early tertiary times. Structures could have been charged using completely different migration routes than in scenarios with hydrocarbon charge coming from the basin centres. Clearly, we still lack a lot of data to substantiate these uplift and migration models on a quantitative basis. The key question is, how much and when were the different regions of the southern Libyan basins uplifted? If we only had thermometers in the rocks that could tell us the detailed history of the cooling and uplift in Murzuk and Kufra. But we're lucky. Hidden in the rocks, there are quite a few paleothermometers that may help to collect this data. There is a number of techniques that can be used to constrain the maximum paleotemperature and as well the maximum depth that a rock experienced uh, in its past. These techniques mainly base on either radioactive decay or on uh, organic maturity and these techniques are in the first order fission track analysis but they are as well uh, vitrinate reflectance, elite crystallinity analysis and fluid inclusion analysis. All of them do refer to different uh, temperatures, they have a different temperature sensitivity. The application of fission track analysis in apatite is particularly helpful in the context of exploration geology because it is as well the oil window and that is a very practical coincidence. Yeah. So let's look at the fission track method for a moment. Fission track works with small apatite grains that form in basement rocks but are also recycled into sandstones. Apatite typically contains radioactive uranium. Uranium fission fragments shooting through the mineral damage the apatite's crystal structure, leaving behind tracks of a typical length. If the apatite is buried deeply enough with temperatures exceeding 125 degrees centigrade, the fission tracks disappear after a while and the apatite crystal structure is fully repaired. But below 125 degrees centigrade, the radiation damage is only partially repaired. The tracks survive, although they're shortened. So, the longer the apatite grain has stayed cooler than 125 degrees centigrade, the more tracks one will find in the apatite today. It's the amount of tracks that tells us when this particular strata cooled down enough to pass through the bottom of the oil window. But there's more. The number of shortened tracks and their detailed length distribution reveals for how long the strata stayed within the oil window because at temperatures lower than in the oil window, that's lower than 55 degrees centigrade, repairing of tracks stops altogether and they retain their original, typical track length. So the technique requires quite a bit of track counting and measuring of track lengths under the microscope. But it's certainly worth the effort. The initial results from a pilot study sound promising. If you consider the two major uplift stages in southern Libya, that are the Hercinian and the Alpine uplift, we do have to estimate uh, different amounts for each stage. It seems, so far as we know, as far as we know today, 
that the Hercinian uplift was more significant for the Gagaf arch. We uh, calculate an order of three or four kilometers of, of uplift at that time, uh, whereas the younger, the alpine uplift perhaps uh, comprises 400 to two meters to two and a half kilometers. This is, of course, very much different over the, over the whole area. Uh, the more one moves towards, towards the basin center, the, the lower are the uplift amounts. Our knowledge about the evolution of the Kufra Basin is even less well constrained than the one about the Southern Gadames Basin, the Gagav Arch and the Mursuk Basin. However, we were able to analyze as well two samples from the vicinity of the, of the Kufra Basin. It seems that in general the evolution is rather similar as in the area between Gadames and Mursuk Basin. That means as well an early Hercinian uplift stage and a late Alpine uplift stage, both with dimensions comparable to the, to the area further in the west. Vitrinite and other maturity data from the northeastern margin of the Murzuk Basin had already inspired some reinterpretations of conventional basin center based source kitchen models. A mesozoic section we see on the north side of the Atchan Saddle gives us a clue for the uh, Ron Patrol Petroleum Province. A simple comparison of well maturity profiles in the area shows something in the order of 2,500 to 3,000 meters of sediment to be stripped off this area. This, in fact, is the missing kitchen for the Ron Patrol Oil Province and for the Atchan Gas Field. So we clearly need more data. Ideally, we want a system of fission track traverses, including both outcrop and subsurface samples. An integration with the results of other paleo temperature techniques would give us an even better picture of what really happened in the past 100 million years. And the samples? In what lithologies do we actually find our fission track appetites? We do find sufficient yields in, in granites or in gabbros as well. Sandstone samples can uh, yield uh, very sufficiently appetite as well, but as an average, only every third sample perhaps works. That means two thirds of the sample do not yield sufficient appetites for an age determination or for a complete measurements of all the data that, that you really need. Nevertheless, sandstones uh, belong to our standard samples because sandstones are very abundant and they're very uh, widely distributed rock types uh, amongst the Paleozoic rocks of Libya. If you collect fission track samples, think big. Several kilograms of rock are needed per sample. In the outcrops, it's easy. Just take a big chunk. In the subsurface, a collection of cuttings over a 100 meter interval would do. The other important contribution of the alpine movements in southern Libya is the reactivation of faults. The main fault of the elephant field is a classical example for long-term structural growth in the Murzuk and Kufra basins. Surprisingly, the structure of the elephant field is actually very simple. It's a very large tilted fault block um, with a very steep reversed fault on one side of it uh, and then a very long dipping fault block. Uh, so nothing particularly complex at all about the structural configuration. Actually working out the timing in terms of when the structure developed is not that easy. It's clear that there were multiple periods of movement on the bounding faults. Uh, most of the faults in the Mazout Basin uh, are of this nature and they probably for, follow a Pan-African trend. There is nearly always a fair degree of structuration during Caledonian times. There seems to be very little effect uh, during the Hassinian movements but there is again uh, a 
uh, structuration during the so-called Alpine movements in tertiary times. And indeed, some of these faults uh, are structures at the surface, like elephant, where you can see waddies deflected around the structure. Uh, but that clearly hasn't affected the integrity of the trap, uh, which contains the hydrocarbons in the elephant field. Uh, and because this is clearly a particularly young structure, at least it has a young phase of history to it, uh, certainly prior to drilling it, one of the risks that was considered to be an important risk was that the structure might be breached and we might have had leakage of hydrocarbons to the surface. What the elephant discovery proved was that, in, certainly in this particular case, that was not the situation. And there seems no reason to think that other faults that we see that extend all the way to the surface may not have very similar histories and that they could also be responsible for trapping hydrocarbons at depth against the faults. So there are surely quite a few faults in the Murzuk Basin that locked the oil in their traps despite fault movements. On the other hand, there are other fields where there's clear evidence for leakage along faults. Uh, leakage upwards. The Atran gas field, for instance, shows uh, quite clear examples of leakage up from the Ordovician reservoir up into several uh, thin units within the Carboniferous that so have gas and oil. There is evidence, both in the Rombotrol area and the Boko area, of oil leaking up into Devonian. But this is, this is Silurian sourced oil, and it's leaked up from, from the basal part of Silurian, or possibly from the Division reservoir underneath, up through the shale, through a fault or, or some gap in the seal, up into the Devonian sands. So it's vertical leakage we're looking at here. Now in the Boko area also, we see what is a really quite fascinating story of charge and then, and then spillage. The, there are two types of fields in the Boko area. One are the, the, the fairly substantial high-relief uh, buried hills, topographic, paleotopographic traps. And the other ones are, on a more platform area, much lower-relief features. So we have the high-relief features and the low-relief features. When we look at the high-relief features, they all have quite substantial oil columns, 60, 70 metres or so, and very thin residual oil columns, or sometimes none. But on the, on the low-relief features, you quite often see thin oil columns and very extended residual oil columns. And that's because all those structures have been tilted after charge. Now, the high-relief features weren't affected by that tilting. You can move them around, and the, 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 the geometry of the trap simply retains, it's very robust, it simply re retains the oil. But you, if you start tilting at a low relief feature, it's very susceptible to tilting. And a lot of the oil that may have been present there originally is tilted out. And now we see uh, extended residual oil columns in those, those accumulations. And we also see uh, signs of uh, migrated oil to the north on the flanks of the Gargaf Arch in uh, a number of water wells. And that oil, in my opinion, is, is leaked up from the, from the Boko area because of that late period of tilting. The elephant seals, the Atshan leaks. So is there really any chance to predict whether a particular fault that you see on your seismic is a sealing or leaking fault? The answer is probably that they seal or leak at different times during their geological history. So it's extremely important to understand the phases of tectonic activity and what the sense of movement was on the faults at those various different periods of tectonic activity. So one of the keys to understanding whether we have a potential trap or a potential leak is to understand in quite some considerable detail not only the geometry of the faults, but their history and timing. Structural traps may be extremely successful, like in the elephant discovery. On the other hand, their individual effectiveness is still hard to predict, and that's caused some bad surprises in Moorzook drilling in the past. So let's look briefly at stratigraphic trap alternatives. Well, there are a lot of dry holes in the Moorzook Basin, and of course the question is why. When one looks at the trapping style of the, the fields discovered by Ron Patrol, Repsol and Lasmo, a quite interesting story begins to emerge. And the one extreme, you have pure stratigraphic traps. These are buried hills with uh, middle division sandstone sealed by Silurian shales. And you can, you can rock and roll that structure around, and it's still going to retain these hydrocarbons. Then you have combination traps with a mixture of structure and stratigraphic. And these two are pretty robust, just so long as the Silurian shale seal is not broken by faulting. 
When then you go to the other extreme, a pure structural trap, such as the one discovered by Lasma, the elephant field, where you have to rely on a cross-fault seal. The water emission reservoir here is displaced against carboniferous shales. So that, in a way, is a unique case. You just get the right juxtaposition of sealing shales against the, against the reservoir, and it works at, it works at elephant. It requires a, a fairly unique combination, just a little bit more up or down than the reservoir is then offset against Devonian sands or carbon river sands, and the oil leaks out. And it's my view that most of the old wells, the ones that were drilled in the 60s and 70s, were drilled on prominent structures, big faults, which were not sealed across the fault. And that is why I think those, those, those early wells failed. I think the message for the future that comes from the Ron Patrol discoveries is, is, is the structures that are really going to survive in an environment of constantly changing, uplift, unroofing, reburial, jostling, rocking and rolling, are the paleo, uh, paleotopographic traps, the buried hill traps. Those are the ones I think we should be looking for in the southern and central part of the Mizzou Basin. <laughs>
Another 200 kilometers further north lies the huge volcanic field of Harush. The Harush consists of 150 volcanoes with heights ranging between 100 to 400 meters. A surreal landscape full of basaltic pyroclastic cones, lava flows and explosion craters. The Harush volcanoes are quite young and were formed mainly during the Pliocene to Holocene. East and west of the volcanic Tibesti Harush axis, the volcanism also partly extends into the Murzuk and Kufra basins. A series of dikes, craters and feeder channels occur in various places around the two basins and may also have affected parts of the subsurface. The volcanism made best use of the existing fault systems and preferentially poured its hot rock melt into these zones of weakness. The Tibesti's twin brother is the Hogar in Algeria. Volcanism here, west of the Muzuk, was very similar and occurred around the same time. And even at the eastern margin of the Kufra Basin, there was tertiary volcanism. Various ring dikes are scattered along the Egyptian border. The most prominent ones are Jebel Aknu and Jebel Awainat. The circular structures represent deep levels of Eocene to Oligocene volcanoes. The upper parts of these volcanic structures and what remains are just the characteristic circular feeder channels. More evidence for massive alpine uplift and erosion along the margins of the Kufra Basin. At Jebel Awainat, large weathered granite blocks are stacked on top of each other like potatoes. It seems the piles could collapse any moment. The sub-volcanic rocks here were first studied by Hassanine Bay, who explored the Kufra area in 1923. The murderous heat made the expedition travel mostly during the nights. Hassanine Bay was fascinated by the Jabal Awainat ring dike. He managed to bring back a few samples for laboratory study, which wasn't that easy, as the petrographer F. W. Moon learned later from Hassanine Bay. As the explorer explains, there was not the freedom of transport he would have desired for making larger collections of full-size specimens, nor did he wish to incur displeasure of those who formed his escort by seeming to do anything that might appear in any way suspicious, such as the constant breaking and collecting of stones. For a long time, the intraplate volcanism in the Tibesti and Hogar was explained by hotspots. The evidence for this, however, seems rather poor. Therefore, an alternative model was proposed in which the compressional stress originating from the Africa-Europe collision has reactivated deep-seated Pan-African faults. These may have provided suitable conduits for the magma of the volcanoes.
So the geodynamic reasons for the tertiary and quaternary volcanism in southern Libya are still very much unclear. Likewise, its implications for the Paleozoic petroleum systems clearly need further study. Again, I think the role of volcanic episodes in the maturity, generation and migration story across the whole of the North African region is a complex one and a poorly understood one. Clearly where we are close to volcanic intrusions, there is going to be a significant local effect, but it is a local effect. We do recognize that there is some overall increase in heat flow at a regional scale that is associated with that volcanic activity. But it's actually very difficult to demonstrate that that has a significant impact on the generation history of the source rock. But not all craters in southern Libya are of volcanic origin. At the northeastern edge of the Kufra Basin, we find two large wounds in the desert. two extraterrestrial rock bodies had visited southeast Libya during the Cretaceous or tertiary and made a rather hard landing. Oil geologists found their impact craters and named them in honor of their respective employers. With a diameter of 11 kilometers, the oasis structure is the larger one of the two meteorite craters. The BP structure, 80 kilometers to the north, is just 3 kilometers wide. <laughs> 